Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. This is a prophetic segment of our news broadcast. Seems like every time we get things that are happening all over the Middle East, the wars, etc., it definitely turns into prophetic broadcasts. The Pope of Rome seems to fulfill quite a few of those, as well as Russia, uh, even the United States, constantly fulfilling Scripture. Uh, the Pope of Rome probably fulfilling the majority of these Scriptures, clearly, in the final days that we're looking at here on this earth. And I've gotten a lot of questions from people. I will be trying to get to all these questions uh, with you guys uh, as, as, as time permits here. Some of those have asked about rapture, things like that. We'll be going into that. Uh, but as we mentioned earlier today, and just a quick little uh, capture video we did with uh, the Apple there, the uh, iPad, I'd mentioned to you that Russia has also again flew about another 50 sorties, bombing more of the rebel strongholds that uh, the United States has been backing there in the Middle East. They, of course, as we all know, they have now a base uh, in uh, Syria. Uh, they are definitely working on Damascus, and uh, Russia has been bombing quite a bit. Uh, they're definitely trying to put an end to uh, the United States-backed rebels, and this, of course, has got the United States all up in arms over this because the U.S. has backed these people. He is, the U.S. has been trying to topple Bashar Assad, President Assad of the Syrian government, and now Russia is there on the ground and actually is doing something about the stop uh, the onslaught of the Syrian government there. Uh, everyone is concerned about Gog and Magog war. Is this what's happening? Or are we actually on the verge of Armageddon? It's hard to say which one is actually there. But clearly, I was uh, sent two scriptures yesterday by you guys that are listening there. And I was asked about two different prophecies and what were my thoughts on those is, is in light of the current events. And the Isaiah 17, Damascus being destroyed, was one of those. And another one that was sent to me was about Daniel chapter 8. And ironically, uh, yes, we are certainly seeing the beginning of these fulfillment of these passages. Now, in time past, I have actually thought myself that uh, Damascus being destroyed may be by some huge bomb, such as a nuclear bomb or something of that sort. But after seeing the video CNN had put together the other day of a city not far from Damascus that was totally a ruinous heap from all the bombing that the coalition forces did with NATO, it's quite evident this is exactly how Damascus will become a ruinous heap as well. An uninhabitable place, except for just the wild animals and the flocks and things of that nature. Not to mention many people have fled the region and gone all over to the world. It's kind of interesting to see this happen because it reminds me of when uh, Titus the Roman general came down into Israel to scatter the children of Israel to all four corners of the earth. Now, of course, he used the Syrian army as part of his coalition forces that he did to, to uh, ransack Jerusalem, to, to destroy the temple, and disperse the children of Israel throughout the entire world. Now, Syria is beginning to reap exactly what she sowed nearly 2,000 years ago. Now, her land is being totally ransacked and she is going into all the different countries around the world. And as the Jews were hated, she is finding as well that she is hated everywhere she goes and is not wanted. Uh, clearly, very interesting how God makes people reap exactly what they sow. Now let's look at the scriptures here. I would like to start with uh, Isaiah 17 because there's something I found interesting in here. Um, in chapter 17 of Isaiah, it says, The burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be a ruinous heap. Notice it's two actions that take place there. One, it'll be taken away, as, uh, uh, is taken away from being a city, becomes a war zone, and it shall be a ruinous heap. So it's not clear from the scripture that it is a sudden destruction of Damascus, but rather something that happens over a period of time, maybe weeks or even months, or even a year or two, that this will actually transpire. Verse 2 says, The cities of Aror are forsaken. They shall be for the flocks, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. Why? There will be no one there to kill the animals, no one to slaughter the animals. And as we have seen, 
Clearly, there is a huge exodus among the Syrian population going to different parts of the world, Europe especially, and the United States, but in the hundreds of thousands have gone into Europe. Uh, and also it says in verse 3, The fortress also shall cease, and Ephraim, uh, the kingdom from Damascus, and the remnant of Syria, they shall be as the glory of the children of Israel, saith the Lord of hosts. Now, I kind of questioned that when I first saw it, the glory of the children of Israel. Well, the word in Hebrew is kavod. Kavod actually is a burden. It's exactly, it could be used as a glory, but it's, it's a heavy weight is what it is. It's not, uh, even if you look at it as the word glory, it is uh, a, a weighty thing regardless. But more commonly from the primitive word and the root word there, kavod, it is a burden for Israel. And why would it be a burden for Israel? Because many of the Jews are still scattered all over the world, not, have not yet come home. And even though God has brought judgment upon Syria for what happened 2,000 years ago and scattered her throughout the world, we may find that these very people who hate the Jews anyway may end up causing many of the Jews to flee to their own nation and become a burden for the Jews in the different parts of the world that they're in now. So I thought that was very interesting. And it goes on to say, And that day shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob, or the burden of Jacob, shall be made thin, and the fatness of the flesh shall wax lean, and it shall be as... Uh, when the harvestman gathered the corn and the reapeth the ears with his arm, and it shall be as he gathereth the ears of the valley of Rimpham. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, and the shaking of olive tree two or three berries in the top of the uppermost part of the bow for four or five uttermost fruitful branches thereof saith the Lord God of Israel, that day shall a man look to his maker and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. That's something I thought was very interesting right there. At that day shall a man look to his maker, his creator, actually Osei in the Hebrew language is Osei, his creator, and his eyes shall have respect to the Holy One of Israel. And he shall not look to the altars the work of his hands, neither shall respect that which his fingers have made, either the groves or the images. Uh, in that day shall his strong cities be as forsaken bow and the utmost part branch which they left because of the children of Israel, and there shall be uh, desolation. Uh, another very, very interesting passage. It, now, it could be, when it talks about the works of his hands, neither shall have they have respect which what his fingers have made. Is it speaking about the third temple being built, and now they don't care about the third temple because their eyes have become on the Holy One of Israel. Mashiach is who that Holy One of Israel is very well could be, but yet Damascus will be become an, a ruinous heap, and that is going to be from Russia bombarding the, the rebels and the ISIS, and, and believe me, Russia is going to take care of ISIS as well, not just the American-backed groups there, and, and of course, then you never know, Russia and the United States may go head-to-head -head at it as well. So, very interesting things to be watching for. Now, Daniel chapter 8. Now to Daniel chapter 8 verse 23 here um, is where I want to begin at. The, you know, the question was asked, could Daniel chapter 8 being be, uh, be being fulfilled? And I certainly agree so, but what really caught my attention is when Gabriel was translating what part of the verses actually meant here, especially like in the case of the two horns there. And if you look at the two horns there, it's clearly Satan in that, or the little horn, sorry, the little horn, when it says in verse 9, And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great toward the south and toward the east and toward the plain pleasant land, and it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground, and, and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the, of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down, and a, and a host was given unto him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth of the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Now, 
when we get to verse 23, this is when uh, Daniel begins to get what the meaning of, of these are, the kingdoms. We also see the Medes of Persia. We see Iran involved in all of this uh, as well. But in verse 23, it says, And in the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the full, and this is Syria, this is, excuse me, this is uh, the Medes of Persia, this is Iran, the different countries that are around Israel. Uh, when, they come, when, they, when they come up there, it says that uh, uh, the king of, of a fierce countenance and understanding, dark sentences shall stand up. When I begin to read this, I, I, clearly, what is it? It's the dragon that gives the Pope of Rome his power. All right? And, and notice what he says. He, he, he stands up. He shall be mighty, but not by his own power. He doesn't use his own, he doesn't have his own military, in other words. He uses it as he woos the different nations into going along with his religious war campaign. He uses those nations, like he, the Roman Catholic Church used England to fight battles at one time. And then they used the United States to fight their battles. And now, and, and by the way, they were doing that. Pope John Paul II did an alliance called the Holy Alliance by Time magazine to topple the Soviet Union, to bring down the Soviet Empire. And now, of course, a, a Catholic himself, a, a Russian Orthodox Catholic, Vladimir Putin has now joined forces with the Vatican and now seeming to be doing the bidding of the Pope as well. So this man has no power of his own, and, and yet he's able to destroy Okay, and his power, he shall be mag uh, mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully or, or miraculously, terribly, and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. You see, he's against Israel, and he's been, the, the Rome has been inciting violence with the Arabs to attack the Jewish people now for decades now, but it's starting to culminate into these last battles here. Why? Because of all the oil down in this area. But of course, the Pope is using the oil to get the people to do the fighting for him so that the Pope of Rome gets complete control of the Jewish state is what he's, what he's trying to do. And of course, the stage is being reset from 2,000 years ago. Rome must be under control once again of Israel in order for Mashiach to finish the mission that he started 2,000 years ago when he read Yeshayahu, Isaiah 61, and he only read verse 1 and half of verse 2. The, the bringing the judgment, delivering from the hand of the Romans is yet to come, my friends, and it's about to come. All right, let's continue on right here. He says here um, in verse 24, as we were, okay, he shall destroy mighty and the holy people. And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper. He'll make the world economically sound. That's what he's doing. That's why he was there in the United Nations. That's why he was speaking to the Congress. He's setting up a new global economic system, a new world order, a new world government, whatever you want to call it there. So he's able to, he, by his power, he shall destroy wonderfully, okay? And, and through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand and he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace notice that and by peace see shalva in hebrew see it's a it's a it's it's a a false peace is what it is see he shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes. I didn't know that one, did you? But he shall be broken without hand. And the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true. Wherefore, shut up the vision, for it shall be for many days yet to come. And remember, I said to you guys, when you were looking at Revelation chapter 13, that great beast that, that raises up there. He's given power to make war with the saints. He's given power to over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. This is when he'll make the craft to prosper. No, remember, when, when, the, when, the, when the great whore is burning in Revelation, uh, I believe, I forget which chapter that is, but when, they, when the, the Vatican burns, the merchants of the world says, how she has come to naught in one hour, and she's made the world rich by her delicacies. You see, Daniel saw that she would make the world rich. Daniel saw that he would make, uh, make, make everything prosper, but he does it 
by what he calls peace, but he doesn't have any peace. He's just using other armies to do the battles, so it makes him look like the good guy and the armies look like the bad guy. So are we seeing prophecy being fulfilled? Absolutely we're seeing it be fulfilled right before our eyes. Soon, friends, soon. And, and, and it really looks like people have asked me, are we in tribulation or whatever? I believe you'll be in tribulation when the two witnesses actually come on the scene. That's when the start of that tribulation period will be. It does appear that even while Damascus is becoming a ruinous heap, which may be over the next months here, we may even see the third temple go up. Now, I can't say that's for sure from what I'm seeing here in the book of Isaiah, but when it talks about that Israel would look to the Holy One of Israel and they would no longer look to the works of their hands or their fingers, that I'm thinking it may be a third temple. But... Nonetheless, it could be that, that Israel recognizes the Messiah and it's no longer that they realize, that, in other words, they don't have to go by the law, they don't have to go by works, but they have been redeemed and they recognize who their Messiah really is. Oh my gosh, what an exciting time we're living in. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom, good evening. I hope I can get this up tonight, friends. Uh, our internet has been down but I trust God will get it up for us so we can get this to you tonight. Shalom. And by the way, our, our condolences are going out to those families who have lost loved ones in Oregon. Uh, we did see the, the tragedy that has happened there. Another gunman there has, has murdered many people. Um, it, it very much a tragedy indeed. Uh, our condolences and prayers for those families that have been affected by this in Oregon. Shalom and good evening.